Hi, I'm Larissa from Beekeeping Made Simple, and this video is about bees in the summer heat. Specifically, what bees do to cope with the summer heat, what the beekeeper can do to help their bees deal with summer heat, what the beekeeper can do to help themselves deal with the summer heat while checking on their hives, and also um, signs that your hive is overheating to the point that the colony might collapse, and also uh, I'm going to include a couple studies that I read about that I found really interesting where they experimented with um, heating up hives and seeing how the bees dealt with it and doing things like taking away water sources to see what the bees would do and what kind of temperatures the bees could withstand. Here in Hawaii, it is August, it is hot out, I don't know how hot it is, it's probably actually only in the mid 80s, but we are closer to the sun than the rest of the country, and so it just feels so, so, so hot out uh, because of the sun. And um, it just feels like everything is melting. I had a block of beeswax, not like a piece of honeycomb, but a solid block of beeswax on a white folding table in our backyard and it melted <laughs> all right so we are ready to do whatever we can to help the bees in this high temperature and these are some recommendations for you one put the beehive in the shade <laughs> if they are not in the shade already sun is usually preferable because uh, the rural mites uh, do not breed as well in this and when the beehives are in sunny spots and it's not good for small hive beetles, but uh, for these high temperatures, move them to the shade. Now you can put a pop-up dent over your hives, which is something I have done when I had bees actually in really rainy areas because I couldn't inspect them for such a long period of time. But you can put a pop-up tent over them uh, when it's really hot out as well. You can also move them. If you're gonna move your hive, just do it at nighttime. You wanna wait till after sunset uh, when you stop seeing a whole bunch of bees flying into the hive. You don't have to move them a mile plus away. That is the usual uh, general rule that people tell you, move your bees at least a mile away. They don't have to be moved a mile away. You just, you know, you don't want to move them like three or four feet away, ideally. You want to move them to the other side of your property. And that might be just 50 feet or 100 feet. But what you want to do is just make it look different. So once you move your bees at nighttime, then you want to just stick something in front of the entrance so that it looks different. A branch is really good. I have my dead papaya branch here. Um, put this in front of the entrance, you know, make it look different. You can add the extra honey super on top because if, especially if you don't have an empty honey super on top. If you're beehive, you just put a honey super on and it's fairly empty then don't put another one on top. But if you just have one brood box or two brood boxes, add an empty honey super on top because this is going to, you know, hot air rises and cool air sinks. So this is going to give a place for the warmer air to go as opposed to your lid being on top of your brood. You also can give the bees an upper entrance. I have a old hive over here, which is now a swarm trap, but I wanted to show you what I do. I take my honey supers and I put, I drill a three quarter inch or one inch hole into the boxes. Additionally, what you can do is just put shims under your lid so that the bees have um, an extra entrance. You can take scrap wood. These are the pieces to frames and you can use them if you like. Um, and you just want to, you know, elevate this lid. You can do a little bit right there, or you can do it on both sides. Um, I also have an entrance reducer. That works well. Put it on there. You can put that there if you think that's too much of an opening, or leave it open like that and give the bees extra entrances. This not only helps clear up some of the passage in the brood box, because now the bees that are out foraging can go straight into the hive through the upper supers and 
drop the honey off there as opposed to having to go through the entire hive and go past all of the traffic in the front entrance where the bees are fanning down the hive. But it also gives the bees an additional place that they can stand and fan their wings. Now, of course you want light colored equipment or you can have the metal lids and that also works well too. Okay, now don't make fun of me too much, <laughs> but you can also put your beehive on a screened bottom. My beehive is on a screened bottom that is a small hive beetle trap. So what I mean by that is, it's one of these guys. It's a screened bottom. However, in the back is a trap for small hive beetles. You put the oil inside the pan, put the screen on top of it. And so um, I leave these on the hive, but if you don't use those oil pans and you're not concerned about small hive beetles, you can just get screened bottoms. Now this, I got a lot of um, the farm I used to work for had stacks and stacks of these old bee boxes that were in bad condition and weren't being used for anything. And they said that I could take whatever I wanted to. So when I was playing around with making my own equipment and trying to save as much money as possible, trying new things, I took some of the old boxes that they had and the hardware cloth and just um, screwed some, some uh, hardware cloth to the boxes for a screened bottom. I don't use screened bottoms in my hives because it is really humid here and the humidity just causes mold within the hives. I'll see it on the wooden equipment. I will see moldy brood. And so um, since most of my bees are in the higher elevations where it's really rainy, uh, my primary concern is keeping the mold out. Whereas if you're in an area where it's humid, but temperatures are getting over 100 degrees, your main concern is keeping the hive cool. <laughs> you really just have to focus on what your biggest problem is and work with that. You're not gonna be able to solve every single problem. Now also, of course, it's very important is to have a water source for your bees. See here, we made one in a shallow dish is best. And we have a stick in here. We have some river rocks from the garden and we even have a pool toy. And so you just fill this up with some water and you wanna put that out for the bees. Now, this might seem like a simple thing to do, but there's a few things to keep in mind when providing water for the bees. One, ideally rainwater, that's best. That has nutrients in it and is best for the bees to drink and is also what they're going to prefer to drink. They're not going to want your tap water. You also want it to be pretty shallow or you really, you just really want to not have too many places for the bees to drown. So you can put corks in there and they float or if it's a shallow container, you can just put rocks and sticks. There's all kinds of things that you can use. People will put marbles in there. You just want places for the bees to land so that they can access the water and not drown when getting to the water. Bird baths work well. The thing is, is the location of your feeder, <laughs> your water source. Uh, it's not like uh, feeding your bee syrup where it has to be inside the hive. You want to put it outside the hive actually, but you can put one near your hive. I mean, cause these are easy to make and this is a cheap container. You can use all kinds of containers you have lying around your house or things you were going to be throwing out in, uh, in the trash, but it, um, there's been some studies on bees, you know, gathering water. And what they found was that bees prefer to go further away from the hive than to the water sources right near the hive. So put a water source as far away from the hive as you can. Put some near the hive, put some maybe somewhere in between because there's a good chance that they're not going to go to the one closest to your hive. Easiest thing to do and what the commercial apiaries that I worked for did was that they had a water trough, you know, like a big trough they use for feeding cows and goats and all of those animals. And they just fill it up with water and then they put some water plants in there like water lilies. And so that they float in the water and you don't have to constantly be filling it up and the bees can land on the water lilies to access the water. 
if you have a pool or neighbors with a pool and they're complaining that the bees are getting into the pool, there's not much you can do to prevent bees from getting into your pool. The chlorinated water isn't good for them, but they are attracted to it for whatever reason. And so dryer sheets can help to deter the bees, but you know, that's not going to work for the entire pool or prevent bees from drowning in the pool. Uh, but you can put it like say by the um, ladder or you know whatever you might have that has the highest traffic to prevent people from getting stung getting in and out of the pool and the best thing to do is to put a towel it doesn't have to be a large towel but you know like a hand towel draped over the ledge somewhere in the pool and so that essentially creates a beach for the bees they can land on the towel and walk on the towel down to the water and access the water that way and then they're not drowning while trying to get to the water and finally this one's on you leave them alone <laughs> over eager beekeeping is one of the worst things that uh, you can do for a beehive so if it's hot out I know you might be concerned about them you want to check on them but disturbing the hive opening it up taking it all apart, disturbing the brew, pulling brood frames out in the sun. None of that is good for the bees. Keep your inspection short and don't do it too often. Definitely do not leave frames of brood, frames with honey on it, out in the sun. You do not want direct sunlight on your comb because I've seen it many times happen to me. The comb just actually starts to melt, especially if you don't use foundation, it will actually just fall out of the frame and if you have a top bar hive it's going to fall off even faster and when i had a top bar hive uh, a couple of times we had the comb fall off the bar and they say you can use hair clips and string to tie that back on but in my experience no you can't <laughs> just a heads up when it is these really high temperatures often what comes next is robbing robbing is when a beehive gets robbed usually from honeybees and wasps. Uh, and this often comes during the high temperatures because when it gets really hot out, flowers start to die. And when the flowers start to die, that means there's no food for the bees to gather. The bees do not want to eat their honey reserves. That is for winter. So they desperately go out and search for food wherever they can find it. Maybe it's your can of soda at the picnic. Maybe it is from another beehive. They are going to look for sugar. That's what they want. So um, there's all those things you can do to prevent robbing uh, throughout your beekeeping season, like not leave honey on the ground, honeycomb, not have feeders outside the beehive, because you don't want to just send out this alert to all of the pollinators out there that like, hey, there's food around because they'll come back during a, a dearth when there's no food around and come look to rob. So um, when that happens, you do not want to have too many entrances in your beehive because there's going to be guard bees at the entrances keeping the bees that don't belong in the hive out but they can't keep everybody out uh, and so uh, you don't want to have like the upper entrances and stuff if you're starting to see robbing now signs of robbing are that you're um seeing bees fighting like literally trying to sting each other on the lid of your beehive you might see oily bees which are bees that are like all black and don't look fuzzy anymore and look very sickly or you're going to see a lot of dead bees on the front entrance of your beehive or on the ground right in front of your beehive that is a sign of robbing season and uh, also your bees will get really cranky like when you open up the hive they're just mad as soon as soon as you open them up or maybe even just sitting next to the beehive they're kind of cranky uh, when normally they're just busy doing their thing those are signs of it being a robbing season which we call a dearth and low nectar which means robbing and you want to just um, close up those extra entrances and assuming it's not too hot out put an entrance reducer on the hive uh, now this one reduces the entrance considerably but uh, 
what's a decent amount of bees in and if it's really really bad then you would want to put it so that there's just a small entrance but if temperatures are getting like you know well above 100 degrees leave the entrance open and um, just take off take away any upper entrance all right to start signs that your beehive is trying to cool itself down and getting heated up well one is because you know it's hot out I mean, you're watching the news you're looking online whatever you're doing and the temperatures are going above 95 degrees fahrenheit but you will also go to the beehives and you will see bearding and bearding is when bees cluster up outside the front entrance and bearding can happen in the daytime and it can happen in the evenings now in the evenings it happens because the hive is heavily populated it's summer there might be lots of flowers blooming and so the population is high and it's just really crowded in the hive as well as warm but just really crowded but in the daytime you will have some bearding outside the hive and that's bees clustering up outside your boxes uh, so that it, there can just uh, they can improve the circulation of air within the hive you also might see bees at the front entrance like right here on the landing board uh, just standing right here and they're going to be flapping their wings really fast and that just cools down the hive and helps circulate air within the hive then you're also going to be seeing bees at your water sources and bees do not drink water because they need to they don't need to drink water for any reason uh, there is lots of water and nectar but they will gather water and bring it back to the hive to cool it down when you inspect your hive you might see that activity has slowed down if you're keeping track of how many frames of honey there are in the hive or how many frames of brood there are in the hive you might see that it is not increasing or it might decrease a little bit and that is because a lot of the foragers are not foraging for honey they are stopping their honey foraging well nectar foraging to gather water and so since there's still a lot of bees in the hive eating honey the amount of honey that they have stored up is going to decrease you might also see a decline in brood or not as many eggs and that is because the queen might not be laying so much in these high temperatures and for some exact temperatures for you guys i have read that 95 degrees fahrenheit is the maximum that the brood should be for an extended period of time however the mighty might thermal heat treatment does heat up the hive to 106 degrees and that is in the hive for hours so uh they say that you can you might see some dead bees within the hive but it does not harm the brood and adult worker adult honey bees can withstand temperatures of 122 degrees fahrenheit so even if the temperatures do get really hot uh, the bees will be cooling it down to a certain extent and then even if brood is harmed the adult bees and the queen will be able to withstand temperatures of up to 122 and in theory be able to build back from that once it cools down honeycomb melts at roughly 140 degrees 130 degrees i harvest honeycomb and once i had some in my car uh, and um i was at a friend's barbecue and i asked him if he wanted some comb because i had it in the car and he put it on the grill and he said i told him i don't think that's a good idea it was at a beach so it was like one of those little beach grills not like you know a big expensive grill uh and i told him i didn't think it was going to work i thought it would just melt but he put the comb on the grill and um the comb actually didn't melt it got a little toasty he took it off after a couple of minutes and it actually tasted pretty good <laughs> grilled honeycomb who knew i think you had it we put it on some uh chicken some fried chicken or something at the barbecue so there you have it you can grill honeycomb when the hive gets hot what the bees do is the foragers stop foraging for nectar i mean some of them might still continue foraging for nectar but some will stop and go out to gather water they're going to bring it back to the hive and they are going to stand on the comb specifically the comb in the brood section and they are going to spit the water all over the comb there will also be bees in there fanning their wings and this is just like those misting fans that people carry around when it's really hot out there's also going to be a lot of bees that are going to be hanging out outside the hive the bearding 
so that this air can circulate and flow and it's not so stuffy in there. And there's also going to be bees at the front entrances, also fanning their wings, circulating air, bringing air from the outside. And so I've actually taken the lid off of a beehive on a hot sunny day and felt like the air just on my hands coming off of the frames. It is uh, quite a remarkable system that they've got going on and it works really well to cool down the hive. Additionally, there are actually bees that act as living water bottles. <laughs> so just in case, I mean, they really have figured out everything, honeybees, they're, they're pretty genius little creatures. There are bees, you know, just in case a drought comes along because along with heat can come a drought, there'll be bees that just fill up their honey crop with water and just sit in the hive <laughs> they just hang out in the hive full of water and they are a water reserve now you might say well why don't they just store it in the honeycomb like they do their honey and their babies and the pollen but if they did that the water would evaporate now if a hive gets too hot you will most likely see dead brood within the hive or a lot of dead brood outside the hive either on the landing board uh, which is you know this little piece outside the front entrance or on the ground right outside the hive or you might see melted wax or honey dripping off of your frames onto the landing board inside your hive i personally have never seen this uh, i've only kept bees in pennsylvania and hawaii uh, here in hawaii it does get hot but it doesn't get you know 115 degrees it just the sun gets really hot. Uh, most of my beehives though are in the higher elevations where it is considerably cooler out and also a lot wetter and also a lot more flowers <laughs> because it's a lot better for the bees. But I do have a few hives at a resort which is an oceanfront property in a desert and that's what the climate zone of that area is. And it's really not a great place for them. They do well in the winter months when the kiave also known as the mesquite tree is blooming and there's lots of food and it's a uh, cooler and breezier but once the summertime comes my hives are in the shade uh, and they uh, do okay but they definitely don't thrive or um, bring in an excess of honey they really just maintain a stable condition with maybe one brood box one and a half brood boxes and for the study, I read about a study where they put a heat lamp near beehives to see what the bees did. And they did exactly what I had described before. They, some foragers stopped foraging and they went out in search of water and brought it back. Be bees were leaving the hive and bearding on the outside so other bees could flap their wings and fan down the hive and cool it down. But what they found was that the hive where they did not provide them a water source was not able to cool itself down. Whereas the other hive that did have a water source and were heated up to the same temperature were able to cool themselves down. Then what they did is they took the water source away from the hive completely and didn't give it back to them. And what they found was that the worker bees were walking around with their proboscis, which is like a tongue, but it's a straw within a straw. Um, they were walking around with their proboscis sticking out and they were tapping other bees bees that would have been foraging and they tapped them with their proboscis and this was their way of letting them know we need water and you need to go out in search of water and so once those bees were tapped with another bee with her proboscis that bee left the hive and went off in search of water and last but not least here are some tips to staying cool when opening your beehive in the summer heat one very important don't open it up at the hottest time of the day <laughs> or the sunniest day of the week wait till it's a little cloudy out. Even if that means opening it up after work on a Monday instead of on the normal Sunday that you open it up. There will be more bees in the hive, but just, you know, be prepared for that. Move slow, have a smoker, and it should be fine. Other thing is, is that you don't have to open up your beehive all the time and it doesn't have to be open for a long time now i was finding that i was keeping uh spending about 45 minutes per beehive for every inspection and that was too much so what i did was i set a timer on my phone and put it in my pocket and i set the timer for 30 minutes and when that went off that meant start wrapping it up you do not need to open up your beehive and look at every single frame you don't have to look at every single honey frame you can just glance down uh, 
lift it to see how heavy it is and get a good idea of how many frames are full and how many frames aren't. And you should not be pulling out every single frame in your brew box almost ever unless you're splitting a hive or really have to find the queen or doing something that requires looking at every single brood frame. One week, maybe your goal is to just get a general idea of what the brood is looking like. Maybe the next inspection, your goal is to get a general idea of how much honey you have. And also just start taking off the safety gear. I just had a student ask me uh, for recommendations for a bee suit. And I realized I never bought a bee suit. I've been keeping bees for 13 years. Uh, I do it year round here in Hawaii now. I worked for commercial apiaries for seven. I never bought a bee suit. My first two years, I wore a lightweight, you know, big long sleeve shirt, wore some baggy jeans, and had a veil, and wore my beekeeping gloves. Those leather beekeeping gloves to start start with the gloves. Those leather beekeeping gloves are hot. Not only are they hot for your hands and leather, but they come all the way up to here. You take off your gloves, you will notice how much cooler you are immediately. So um, it might seem scary at first to start, you know, maybe just take off your gloves once the hive is open and you see that they're pretty calm do a couple of things, put the gloves back on. Uh, but I highly recommend getting yourself used to keeping bees without gloves on. I put gloves on when I'm doing things like harvesting honey, like pulling honey off the supers, maybe splitting a hive if I think it's necessary. And during times of year when I think the bees are aggressive. Otherwise, I do not wear gloves. I used to swelp really badly when I was stung by a bee. I got two stings in my knee and my, the swelling went down to my ankle and I was limping around for a couple days. I got stung in the face. I had this huge waddle <laughs> hanging down <laughs> under my face <laughs> for a couple days. It was a very bad swelling I was getting. But after a year or so of keeping bees, um, I mean, this was a full-time job so year round so I was getting stung a lot <laughs> and I stopped wearing my gloves and I started to get daily stings you know five to seven stings every time I was out with the bees I now do not swelp whatsoever I've opened beehives many 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 times in a t-shirt and shorts tank top and shorts flip-flops and of course you put your bees in the shady spot or you put a pop-up tent over your bees you're not only giving your bees uh, a break from the sun but you're giving yourself a break from the sun don't forget to take breaks if you are out with the bees and you're just really hot take breaks bring an umbrella or have a shady spot that you can stand bring some ice water it's really easy to forget to take a water break when you're keeping bees especially when you have that veil and everything that you have to take off but have something with a straw so that you can just unzipper the veil and you can get something to drink really easily i have also <laughs> forgotten I'm wearing a veil and just put the cup up to my mouth directly. Don't know if anyone else, if you've actually <laughs> done that. I've been so hot that like sweat has dripped off my face and onto bees and I've just seen them like kind of like almost cringe and like go back deep down into the hive grossed out by what just happened. Now a coworker of mine, he worked for the bee company for decades. Something he used to do is he used to just set an empty box down on the ground on its side and he would sit on the box and open the beehive. He could just do some quick brood inspections. And then finally, keep bees with a buddy. I started beekeeping with a friend and it is really helpful to just have someone out there, not only to problem solve with and to make it fun and a little bit less stressful when you have someone to talk things through with, uh, but when you're out there and it's really hot and you have someone else there with you then you guys can really just take breaks and uh you know one person is there for half of one hive and one person does the other hive and then you're done a lot faster or one person does the inspection one week and one person does the inspection the next week and you'll get a little bit of a break uh, as well as ability to take a longer summer vacation so something to consider as well, even if one of the people that you do this with isn't as into it as you are, <laughs> that's okay. If they're willing to learn, if they're willing to uh, assist, 
and they're willing to be the your assistant and still you know be there for a lot of the inspections and for what you do that can be a huge help for you especially your first few years keeping bees now don't forget it is really important to plant uh, plants for your bees especially the ones that are going to be blooming in the late summer and fall and plants that are drought tolerant and plants that are native to your area goldenrod is one of those plants that is just great for this time of year it is a huge floral source for bees it's not a honey that you so much want to eat but it is a honey that is going to really help the bees get through the winter do a quick search uh, a Google search to look for drought tolerant plants in your area. Do a search for late summer blooming plants in your area and go to xerxes.com, xerxes.org. And they have a lot of maps for the United States and helpful information for people that want to help the pollinators. If you're looking for a full beekeeping course where you learn from top to bottom how to care for your bees and keep them healthy year round, plus mentorship and a person to go to for help, check out my online beekeeping class at beekeepingmadesimple.com.